You ever notice how we sit inside our houses, heat on high fuzzy socks, two blankets deep, and still grumble about the cold? Meanwhile, 600 years ago, a Lakota family slept on an open prairie wind, howling like a hungry wolf snow, piling outside their teepee. And somehow, they were fine. No thermostat, no plug-in heater, just fire hides, and knowledge passed from one frozen winter to the next. Picture it a single teepee standing against a wall of white smoke drifting slow through the night air. Inside, the air glows faintly orange and every breath turns to mist. They weren't fighting the storm, they were sleeping through it, peacefully. So here's the question, how did they do it? Because if most of us spent one night out there, we'd be popsicles by sunrise. Tonight, you'll learn seven ancient sleeping tricks so simple, so clever, they might just shame your electric blanket. Imagine this, a small fire flickering right in the middle of a teepee orange light, dancing on buffalo hides, smoke rising in lazy spirals toward the cold sky. The wind outside sounds like a wolf's cry, and yet inside, it's calm, warm, safe. Now to anyone today, that setup sounds insane. A fire inside a tent made of animal skin. That's not camping, that's arson with extra steps. But somehow, it worked. And not just once it worked through entire winters. See, the fire wasn't big. It was shallow, carved into a pit, maybe six inches deep. That depth wasn't random, it was physics. It pulled air inward from the bottom, feeding the flames just enough to stay alive. Then smoke rose up through adjustable flaps at the top, like primitive exhaust vents. Tilted right, they caught the wind and pulled smoke upward, keeping the air clean and the warmth steady. It was basically a natural convection system, what we'd now call primitive HVAC. No batteries, no wires, just wind pressure and pure instinct. But here's what most people miss. It wasn't automatic. Someone always had to tend the flame. Adults took turns feeding dry wood, adjusting flaps, making sure smoke never built up. Too much flame and the teepee turned into an oven. Too little and the kids woke up shivering. They balanced heat like a living organism breathing, adapting alive. So while we rely on thermostats and digital sensors, they relied on eyes, ears, and a sixth sense honed by survival. They didn't just light a fire, they understood it. They read its rhythm, its hunger, its breath. And that's why in the middle of a frozen prairie, surrounded by snow and silence, one little flame could keep a family alive. Sometimes life and death aren't separated by walls or machines. Just by one good fire and one right breath of wind. You ever tried lying down on frozen ground? It's not like sleeping on dirt. It's like curling up on a block of ice that slowly drinks the warmth right out of you. Within an hour, your body heat is gone, your muscles start to tremble, and your bones feel like they're turning to glass. That's why native families didn't just sleep on the earth, they built a system with it. First came the willow mats, woven tight layer upon layer, like nature's carpet. Those fibers trapped tiny pockets of air, and air, as we know, is insulation's best friend. On top of that came a thick layer of dry grass, springy enough to breathe, but dense enough to block frost. Then the final touch, buffalo hides fur side up leather side down. The fur held heat. The leather stopped drafts. When the cold grew brutal, they added one last ingredient, river stones heated by the fire and wrapped in hide. Slid beneath the bedding, those stones released warmth for hours, like primitive heating pads powered by patience and instinct. Think about that. No foam, no sleeping bags, no synthetic layers. Just dirt, grass, stone, and hide arranged in a perfect balance of physics and wisdom. They didn't fight the frozen earth, they persuaded it. By morning, the snow outside froze solid, but the ground inside the teepee stayed warm enough for bare feet. Kids could crawl from the hides and still feel a trace of heat rising from below. We chase comfort with gadgets, heated floors, electric pads, smart thermostats, but they built theirs with hands and logic. They didn't just survive the cold, they outsmarted it, they slept warm. 
The wind outside howls like a starving wolf, slapping snow against the teepee walls, bending the poles, shaking the world. But inside, it's another universe. The air glows amber from the small fire in the center. Shadows ripple across buffalo hides stretched tight over the frame. A family lies bundled together wrapped in layers so thick, the storm might as well be happening on another planet. You can almost hear it, the crackle of fire, the steady breathing, the rhythm of warmth beating back the cold. Now a single buffalo hide might feel warm for a minute, but when the temperature dives to 30 below, that hide alone is about as useful as a paper towel in a blizzard. The secret wasn't the material, it was the architecture, the system. They built warmth the same way a mason builds a wall layer by layer with purpose, fur in leather out. The inner hide was soft and thirsty, pulling moisture from skin before it could chill. The middle hide, thick fur, trapped air, the invisible hero of insulation, and the outer hide. That was the armor. It blocked the wind sealed, the heat turned the tipi into a breathing cocoon. Every hide had a role, every layer breathed. Together, they formed a self-regulating microclimate primitive design so elegant it could teach modern engineers a thing or two. By dawn, the teepee looked frozen solid from the outside glazed in ice. But step inside and the air was still warm enough to fog your breath. Kids could wiggle bare toes under the hides and still feel the heat of family. No down comforters, no high-tech sleeping bags, just hide air and human logic. They didn't chase warmth, they designed it. They understood that comfort wasn't softness, it was structure. So next time you wrap yourself in a heavy blanket and still feel cold, remember this warmth lives between the layers, in the air, in the knowledge, in the discipline. They didn't just sleep under hides, they slept inside science, and science never shivers. When the fire burned low, they didn't panic. They plan for it, because in a teepee, once the flames fade, the cold moves fast, creeping like a thief across the floor, stealing warmth from sleeping bodies, one breath at a time. But native families had a trick up their sleeve. They charged stones like batteries. Picture it, the evening fire roaring strong, casting light across the hides. Near the edge of the pit, smooth river stones are nestled in the coals, glowing faint red. They're not decorations, they're power cells, ancient and silent. Each family had a rotation system. As the night deepened, the fire tender would pull a few stones out with wooden tongs, roll them into ash, or wrap them in hide, then tuck them near the bedding beside feet, under hides, sometimes even between sleeping children. The heat seeped slowly, gently, evenly. Hours later, when one stone cooled, another took its place quiet rhythm, no electricity, no switches, just patience and precision. That's thermal management 600 years before thermodynamics had a name. The stones absorbed the fire's energy, released it through the night, and kept the microclimate stable. A primitive heat bank charged with ember paid in time. Think about it while we today rely on thermostats and smart home systems to stay cozy. They stayed warm with nothing but fire rock and routine. No wasted energy, no noise, no failure. And maybe that's the part we've forgotten. Warmth doesn't always come from comfort, it comes from awareness. From tending the flame, replacing the stone, listening to the crackle of life continuing through the night. One small stone, that's all it took. Between shivering and sleeping, between danger and rest. They didn't need power grids, they made their own. Stone by stone, heat by heat. You probably think of a teepee as just a cone of hides and poles, simple rustic, barely more than a tent. But in truth, it was a masterpiece of natural engineering, a living structure that breathed balanced and managed heat with the grace of a modern HVAC system centuries before the term existed. Here's the problem. Fire gives warmth, but also smoke. Too strong, and the tippy fills with fumes. Too weak, and the cold creeps in like a silent thief. The solution, the perfect middle ground of flame, that breathes, and a smoke layer that works for you, not against you. Imagine standing inside the teepee on a frozen night. The fire crackles low and steady. 
Above it, a thin layer of smoke gathers hovering just below the top like a faint mist glowing orange. That's not pollution, it's insulation. A smoke blanket. The heat rising from the flames meets the cooler air coming down from the smoke flaps. When the balance is right, the smoke traps a cushion of warm air beneath it, creating what we now call a thermal ceiling. Below that invisible barrier, the air stays toasty stable and breathable. By adjusting the flaps depending on the wind's direction, they could fine-tune the airflow. Some nights, they even angled the hides to create a slow air curtain, an invisible wall that stopped cold drafts from spilling in. Every flap, every vent, every breath of smoke had purpose. They didn't need temperature sensors. They had instinct. They didn't need thermostats. They had experience. Think about it. Modern architects struggle with airflow optimization using computers and equations. But 600 years ago, a Lakota elder could step outside, taste the wind, and know exactly how much to open the flaps to keep his family warm. Even smoke the thing we modern folks try to escape became a tool, a shield, a teacher. In the right hands, even a wisp of smoke carries wisdom. The wind outside moans like an old flute sliding between the tippy poles. Inside the fire glows low a red heartbeat in the dark, and around it people sleep in quiet circles. Not scattered, not alone, but together woven into one warm organism. You see, if everyone slept separately, the heat would vanish fast. One person, one small fire. But sleep in a circle, and suddenly you have a living furnace. It's simple physics, wrapped in human instinct. Imagine it, a semicircle around the central fire pit. Elders and children tucked safely in the middle adults, forming the outer wall, arms and legs pointing inward, heads turned out. The warmth from each body radiates to the next, bouncing back and forth like invisible light. Their breath mingles. Their heat combines. The air hums with life. Every body becomes a heat source. Every heartbeat adds to the collective warmth. Scientists today might call it communal thermoregulation. The Lakota, they just called it family. This sleeping pattern wasn't random, it was calculated. The distance from fire to skin, the airflow, even the order of bodies, all tuned for survival. If the night grew harsher, the circle tightened. If the tippy got too warm, it loosened again. A self-adjusting system powered by empathy. Think about that. We build electric blankets, space heaters, and smart thermostats, each one designed to isolate comfort. But they, they built warmth by coming closer. No gadgets, no noise, just human proximity turned into technology. It's funny, isn't it? We talk about personal space like it's sacred, but for them, shared space was survival. They didn't sleep apart because comfort wasn't personal, it was communal. So when the storm howled and the teepee trembled, they didn't shiver alone. They breathed together, slept together, warmed each other. Because warmth, real warmth, doesn't come from fire. It comes from people. When the storm truly came, when the wind bit like knives and snow turned to dust on the skin, no blanket could save you. Not fur, not hide, nothing but the earth itself. And the people knew that. You ever heard of tallow and ash? Sounds like something you'd scrape off an old skillet right. But to the Plains tribes, it was armor, their final defense against the kind of cold that cracks bone and freezes breath midair. They mixed buffalo fat rich thick, full of trapped heat with ash from the previous night's fire. Not random ash either. They chose the fine gray dust full of carbon that holds warmth like memory. Then they rubbed it on their wrists, their cheeks, their necks. Every exposed inch became a barrier. The ash absorbed and radiated heat. The fat sealed it in and blocked the wind. Together, they created a natural insulator, a primitive thermal lotion. And when that wind howled through the plains at 3030 their skin didn't crack, didn't bleed. The cold slid off like water off wax. Imagine the smell of the mix of smoke, fat, and fire. Today, we'd wrinkle our noses. Back then, it smelled like safety, like family, like survival itself. 
Scientists would tell you this worked because lipids trap air and ash reflects infrared radiation. But they didn't need lab tests to know that. They learned it the way true knowledge is learned through winters survived, through pain endured. Think about that next time you complain about dry skin from your indoor heating. They didn't have moisturizers. They had buffalo grease and grit. And somehow they walked through the same cold that shuts down entire modern cities. We run from dirt. They turned it into protection. We scrub off the smell of smoke. They wore it with pride because to them, warmth wasn't about comfort. It was about belonging to the earth, to the fire, to life itself. Dawn creeps in pale blue, quiet, gentle. Smoke drifts from the teepee's crown, curling into the frozen air like a ghost of the night's fire. Inside, the embers still glow. The children sleep tangled together, faces calm wrapped in buffalo hide and dreams. No electric heater, no thermostat, just knowledge, ancient, simple, earned. They didn't conquer the cold. They learned to dance with it. That's the thing most of us forget. We keep inventing new ways to fight nature. While they survived by understanding her rules, they studied wind like language fire, like art snow, like a teacher. We chase warmth through gadgets and batteries. They found it through wisdom and connection. Their survival wasn't comfort, it was comprehension. So here's a question. Endurance if tonight the storm came the cold, and all you had was a teepee, to... a few hides and your own hands, could you make it till dawn? Because sometimes the fiercest blizzard isn't the one outside the tent. It's the one inside us.